Hi, welcome to the Love and Serve podcast. I'm your host, Christy, and I am super excited to share with you. This podcast is all about loving where you've come from, loving where you are, and loving where you are going. I am honored to be on the journey of self-love with you together. Let's dive in. When your brain is balanced, your overall daily performance improves. You can have better mood, less procrastination, and less anxiety. Eating healthy, exercise, and proper rest contribute to a healthy brain. But we don't live in a perfect world every day, and some days we need a little extra support. My friends over at GNAPS have solved this problem and created a breakthrough formula that works. And I'm also super happy that it saved me a ton of money. Before, I was buying five different products to get the same results as I get now. But what I love most about it is that they didn't add caffeine and stimulants that cause negative effects. Instead, they used high-quality active vitamins like B12 and folate and one of my favorite brain aminos like 5-HTP that helps me to sleep better and control my appetite. I enjoy drinking my coffee in the morning, and when I take my G-Mood, I don't have the coffee jitters like I normally have. Instead, I'm calm and focused and super productive. So all my friends out there listening, you can get a special discount if you head on over to GNAPS. Dot com. That's G-N-A-P-S E dot com. At checkout, use Love20, that's L-O-V-E, two zero, and get 20% off plus free shipping and handling on your order. Well, hello, everyone. I am so incredibly excited about today's interview because this human is someone really close to my heart. He's one of the world's most treasured souls because he shows up and he does the work. He's done the work and he's inspired me. And I truly believe millions of people now to step into a more conscious life. So David is the co-founder of Sports One Marketing and formerly served as CEO of the renowned Lee Steinberg Sports and Entertainment Agency, which was the inspiration for the movie Jerry Maguire. David is recognized by Variety Magazine as the their Sports Humanitarian of the Year and awarded the Ellis Island Medal of Honor. He is also the executive producer of the Bloomberg and Amazon Prime television series Two Minute Drill and Office Hours. His life mission is to empower over 1 billion people to be happy. This simple yet powerful mission has led him on an incredible journey to provide one thing, value. In all his content and communication, that's exactly what you'll receive. As part of that mission for the past 20 years, he's been providing free weekly trainings to empower others to empower others to be happy. My dear sweet brother, how are you? Welcome. I am a lot better than I've ever been just seeing your wonderful face and soul and energy. It's a privilege to always be with you. And even virtually, I can feel your energy come through me. So thank you so much for having me. Oh, it's, it's just, I feel like I'm home again. You know, when you meet people in your journey and you just, it feels like home when you're together. So I'm so excited to be sharing this space with you. And I, I, I was just sharing with you before we started recording that I watched your 1 billion video and the 1 billion lives video. And I'm literally had no idea what to expect. Of course, everything you do is super magical, but I was like, tears were streaming down my face and I'm my my partner looks over at me and I'm sobbing he's like what's going on I'm like it's David he's doing it again (laughs) wow wow so beautiful thank you yeah well I think uh when you're on a mission that resonates with the majority of the souls on earth the idea of one particle of light to overcome a million particles of darkness in a day and age in which so many people are separate uh inferior superior anxious, frustrated, angry, depressed, offended, that we have to focus or refocus back into the appreciation, not only of how similar we are. I think it's trite and common to say, well, we're all human. You know, let's believe in humankind. I think what's more important is why aren't we uh, striving to appreciate the differences? See, the true definition of oneness is when we can appreciate the differences, because by adding value to the differences, we create a whole, we create the oneness, we create and lessen the interference between ourselves, uh, which will create even more energy exponentially compounding upon itself to like that video shows, right? Billions. And when we create a collective consciousness that's uh, in synergy with this type of perspective, I promise you there'll be abundance. There'll be more than enough of everything for everyone that all the silly things that have separated us will just seem trite in itself and we will have everything that we want, need, 
and we will be happy. Mm, yeah, it, that video, what got me the most was the woman in the front of the room who was sobbing and said that she, you know, wasn't sure what she was going to get. And what inspired me was that that day you chose to show up and she chose to show up. And it was two souls sharing their pain or their trauma. And she said something like, I don't have your story, but I knew if I could be here, you know, I, I could possibly be inspired. And I thought that's all we're doing for each other, right? It's just showing yeah. up for each other. It's so true. And I think people forget the importance, it, and not just showing up, of of smiling or telling someone how they feel. And I think that vulnerability, as I get choked up right now, thinking of the power of showing up and how you show up for so many people and how it inspires me to continually show up. And, you know, <laughs> my superpower has been just to be consistent, to consistently show up for everyone knowing the value of everyone in my life, whether, you know, I have this five minute and 20 minute rule in my life. I'll give five minutes on the phone to anyone on earth. And people are like, you're crazy. And I'm like, I'm not. I, I always can find five minutes and I find it every day for everyone. And I can always, if someone's willing to show up for me to fly in and to meet with me, uh, you know, I give 20 minute meetings, 20 minute interviews to anyone. And why won't you, uh, if someone's willing to, put the effort or interest into or intention or attention into what I have to share, then I almost see it as, uh, you know, to me, a counterintuitive, counterproductive thing by not providing the vessel uh, to fill. And so 520 rule I live my life by, and I'm probably one of the more consistent, if not the most consistent person uh, of giving the 520 every single day, seven days a week. Yeah. You've taught me that like, since I've known you, you know, what I've learned from you, so many things, by the way, I've watched how you've led your, your people in person, watching them, you know, sit in, you know, on the grass and you're serving them lunch and you're speaking into them and I could feel your love and they can feel your love and they are just feeling this connection with you and they can feel that you truly, truly care for them. And that gives them permission to show up in a bigger, greater way, right? Because they're being seen. And when people don't feel like they're seen, they don't show up a hundred percent, right? But you've cultivated this community, not just within your organization, but I feel like every person that you talk to, you see them, you see them, you're with them. And that's what makes you such a powerful force in our world right now, David. You talk about, I forget how long we've been friends and um, you were there. I joke about having Friday trainings for over 21 years, every Friday. And I joke, but you know, it used to be far more expensive because I buy everybody lunch uh, and, you know, it started with two people and then hundreds of people would show up. And then with the pandemic, all of a sudden it's over 50,000 people registered. And I joke to my wife, thank goodness I don't have to pay for lunch uh, anymore. It's, it's more impactful. It's more impactful and a lot less expensive. Uh, but I do, um, you know, I, it's one of the most important things that I do. And I've done all types of training. It's not, you talk about meeting people where they're at. Uh, in showing up, you know, I've done mommy issue trainings. I've done ultimate ego trainings. I've also been very granular and I do exceptional sales training and how to pitch. You know, I have one of the best pitch shows in the world, $50,000 of cash and prizes on Bloomberg and Amazon. And, you know, I believe that the skill set, I, I had to walk away. I'm executive producer of Elevator Pitch, but I've walked away from being on the show because, you know, like Dragon's Den and Shark Tank and Elevator Pitch, I didn't think I was of service by having just a TV show when it wasn't real. You know, there's no real funding on TV. And until there is, I'm, I'm negotiating with a show right now that has real funding. But until there is, I want to keep it real and help people. And I think pitching is a skill set. Uh, you're an extraordinary pitch woman yourself. Uh, but it's a skill set I could teach on a TV show. I can give real advice. I can't give real advice about funding but I can give real advice about pitching. And so whether it's that real advice, pragmatic advice about selling, pitching, or it's, you know, something emotional about, you know, having mommy issues or worthiness issues or ego issues, or even more, you know, more exciting for me is the metaphysical trainings that I do uh, about, you know, the world of more than enough. Uh, all of them in the pragmatic, the subconscious and the con in the unconscious realm have applicability to this realm, uh, the pragmatic world of time. 
And uh, you've always been a co-pilot with me in this journey. And, you know, the universe is blessing both of us by giving us an opportunity uh, with those kids on the on the grass. Right. We're planting seeds under trees that we may never sit under, but they will grow and provide shade and more seeds for more people as as we in our journey uh, continue on. Well, it's the, you know, <laughs> what's, what, what you could say too is uh, you're breaking bread and feeding the souls, right? So, so that's so beautiful, 50,000 feeding of the souls. And that's really what I, what, what stands out so much about you, David, is yes, you hustle, but you hustle because it's coming from the heart. You have a hustler's heart, but you have a consciousness with that. And what I, you know, I was, I love the practice of karma yoga, where if you really want to be happy, to serve, like just serve. And, you know, I, I, I think of all the times that I've really struggled in the introspection or the retraction of my soul, bringing it back in and doing the work in order for me to expand out. Um, I've needed to go in and do that work. So I want to dig in a little bit with you in regards to, I know your story. A lot of our listeners don't know your story. It's a powerful story. And because you were at the penthouse and you went to a drop to the outhouse and the outhouse of the soul, like, I love this story. So if you could just share a little bit about that. And so the listeners can today, today can feel how your comeback has been such a beautiful conscious comeback and how we can come back as souls too. Sure. I think my story, uh, is in three different worlds. The first is the world I was born into, the same one I think you were born into. Um, I had a single mom. My dad left when I was five, six kids, five boys, one girl. And my mom was extraordinary. Uh, and she taught me, I always say, as you'll know, because you're a parent like me, you know, our kids don't listen to us. Well, I certainly did not listen to my mom, uh, but I watched her. I'm going to try to get through this without choking up too many <laughs> times because I adore my mom. And I just... I, I think back to how hard it was and how wonderfully hard it was. I, I so much love in my family between my mom and my siblings. And, uh, but we had no money. Uh, you know, she worked two jobs. She packed my dinner so many nights in a paper bag as she came home from school uh, as a second grade teacher and put us into a back of a country squired station wagon that worked some of the time. And when it didn't work, I'd catch her crying because we had so much financial stress. How was she going to feed us? And then to fill turnstiles, you know, at convenience stores, just, just so we could eat. And I didn't listen to her. She wanted me to be you know, doctor, lawyer, study hard. And I just wanted to be rich. <laughs> I wanted to be rich because I wanted to buy her a house, a car. I, you know, I lived in a world of not enough. I didn't have enough of anything except for love. I, I had these siblings, extraordinary siblings. They went to Harvard and Penn and Columbia, and they graduated soon cum laude, and they're of service. My own name, my own name, David Meltzer. David means beloved, and Meltzer means servant or waiter. I was born to be a beloved servant. And that's really what my mom was. Now, I was motivated and inspired by money because it was the only thing that was missing in my life. The only hole in my life was financial. So in a logical five-year-old or seven-year-old or 10-year-old's mind is, hey, if there's only one thing missing, if there's not enough of one thing, maybe that's the most important thing, the thing that you better strive for. So I wanted to be rich. And every the advantage of wanting to be rich is there's always more more to have and there's more options to make more. So my journey was one of figuring out how I could make the most money. My first idea was to be a professional football player, uh, and that ended quickly. But it, it taught me uh, that I could enjoy the consistent, persistent pursuit of my potential. Because the one thing that has helped me in football uh, is that never once... Did I step on a football field and the coaches, the players and the fans not laugh at me, scoff at me, make fun of me and tell me I couldn't do it. And somehow I, I did it and I did it to my potential. I could never be a Warren Moon, who's my business partner, a Hall of Fame quarterback, but I was an average college football player. And to my potential, that's extraordinary. Uh, but when I got ran over my freshman year, I remember lying on my back saying, doctor, lawyer, or failure, I better start 
listening to my mom because this football thing is not going to provide me a house and a car someday. Uh, and so I went and wanted to become a doctor quickly. My brother, my oldest brother, who was a doctor, uh, gave me the best advice of my life. He said, when I walked into the hospital to visit him and I told him I hated hospitals and he almost fell over in shock. He's like, you're going to be a doctor. You don't like hospitals. I'm like, well, I don't want to be a hospital doctor. I'm going to be a sports doctor. I'll be on fields and in locker rooms. And he looked at me and I hope everyone writes this down. He looked at me in shock and he said, David, you need to be more interested. You need to be more interested than interesting. And I will tell you if there's anything that has helped me expand, grow and accelerate my journey is I shifted my perspective from that day. I was going to be more interested in people. I was going to ask open-ended questions. I was going to find out what people liked and didn't like. I was going to find out what they needed and how I could be and provide service to them. And then later on in life, as I'll should explain, I'm going to figure out how people can help me. That's part of being interested, you know, receiving. Because all I wanted to do was give, and I fell into some great, uh, struggles, mistakes, and failures because all I wanted to do was give and I forgot uh, I can't give what I don't receive. So I ended up going to law school, keeping my options open. I graduated. I went to be an oil and gas lawyer because they made the most money. I wanted to make money to buy my mom a house and a car. I would have shoveled shit with my hands tw literally 12 hours a day, six days a week. If somebody would have promised me that I could buy my mom a house and a car and pay off my law loans, that would have been a problem. So why not just go to law school, which paid the most? But I also kept my options open. So I had a $150,000 a year lawyer job being an oil and gas litigator. But I also had a sales job in 1992 offered to me to sell legal research as a lawyer on the internet in 1992. And so I went to my mom and I asked her, you know, what should I do, mom? I got these two great jobs. I'm gonna buy you a house and a car someday. What should I do? Without blinking, she tells me, David, you need to be a lawyer. Internet's a fad. This thing's not gonna last. Don't be like your father chasing dreams. You, you need, the second lesson that I learned, which is still something that's evolved today is that, just because someone loves you doesn't mean they give you good advice, but it even goes farther today because I believe everyone on earth is ignorant. And this is an important lesson. See, everyone on earth doesn't know what they don't know. There's two types of ignorant people though. Ignorant, humble people, which I thought I was. And then there's ignorant, arrogant people, which lie, manipulate, cheat, steal, and oversell and back end sell you. And they pretend like they know what they're talking about to take advantage of you. Well, one of the lessons I learned later on in life is that when we love our children, when we love our children too much, that we're actually ignorant, arrogant people out of fear. That my mom was ignorant, arrogant because she only wanted the best for me. And so she projected her own insecurities about her greatest fear was for me not to be okay for me not to be happy, for me not to be healthy, for me not to be wealthy, for me not to be worthy, that she pretended like she knew what she was talking about out of fear. And so one of the distinguishments in ignorant arrogance is that sometimes we have to be careful when we love somebody too much that we pretend to know what we don't know. And I see many parents today, including me, give advice that is out of arrogance, out of fear, not out of manipulation, not out of cheating or lying or overselling and back end selling, but out of love that we love too much. And we are too afraid to allow our children who we care so much about into that context in this world of more than enough. My whole paradigm had shifted when someone taught me the greatest lesson, which was, David, do you know how you feel about your children? I said, of course I do. Do you know what you would do for your children? Of course I would do. Do you know what you would give to your children? Yeah, of course I do. Well, you're ignorant. You're not all powerful, all knowing. You don't know what you're doing. And yet you would give all that. Here's something called faith. Here's, there is an omniscient source. There's an all powerful source. There's an all knowing source. And that source feels the same way about you. It loves you the same way that you love your children and would do all that you would do for your children, except for it isn't ignorant and humble. It is all knowing, all powerful. That's what you have inside of you and beside of you at all time. My faith 
grew that day exponentially when I understood that which feels the same way about me. The same way my mom feels about me as an ignorant, arrogant mom, as an ignorant, humble mom, is the same way source, God, Jesus, Muhammad, Joseph Smith, Buddha, whatever you believe feels about me. That was the empowering time of my life. And it came later in my life because nine months out of law school, I took that internet job. 1992, I was a millionaire. I bought my mom a house and a car. I thought money bought love and happiness. 95 came, I was a multimillionaire. We sold the company for $3.4 billion. By the time I was 30, I was married to my dream girl from the fourth grade. And, you know, I asked her to go steady at sixth grade camp to my best friend. Bob. He said, no. Go ahead. No, you were intuitive then. You you knew what you wanted then. I love Julie. She's amazingly beautiful. Uh, yeah, my blessing. And she saved my life, as you'll find out. But yeah, I, I was married. I had everything I ever dreamed of, except for I wasn't happy. And at 30 years old, I would have the first warning about living in not the world of not enough where everything was happening to me as a victim. I had now entered the world of just enough, just enough for me. I thought I was a philanthropist. I would give to charities so I would get recognition, acknowledgement. I'd feel good about myself. So as Bob Proctor taught me, Dave, you are the ultimate negotiator. You are the ultimate trader. You were trading. You were giving to receive. And that wasn't really what I wanted. And it created a void, a shortage, an obstacle in my life. And my father, of all people, the man who left me when I was five, who I thought when I was five, my dad was my hero. You'll, you'll get this part too, Christy. My dad was my hero. And my dad was a deadbeat dad in the 70s. He was rich, good looking, successful, but he wasn't paying child support. He was married to a girl closer to my age than, than his. But at 10 years old, he blew it. He went from hero to zero because he forgot my birthday. Now that was bad enough, but what he did to change my life was he lied to me. When I confronted him about, dad, it's my birthday and you forgot, he said, no, no, no. I didn't forget your birthday. I don't believe in birthdays. That blatant lie, because he had celebrated his birthday, his wife's birthday, my sibling's birthday, the fact that he could easily just lie to me like that created so much hate in my heart for him. It, it hurt, really. I shouldn't say hate, but I wasn't old enough to understand hurt. It created so much hurt that he was a liar, a manipulator. My hero was a cheater, an overseller, a back-end seller, that he could tell me something that was so obviously, and we have these people that bleed us in our lives, that they don't even care enough to, to even have any credibility. They, they'll just say whatever it takes that they think that someone else would believe. I hated him, but at 30... He gave me a birthday present 20 years later. I hadn't talked to him. I, I, I wanted nothing to do with him. I was ashamed of him. And here I was at 30 with everything in the world. And he sends me a birthday present. I open it up. Gorgeous sport coat. And it fits perfectly. And I start to cry. As you know, I cry easily. And my wife's like, what's the matter? I said, oh my gosh, my dad finally get it. He gets it. He's, he's seeking forgiveness. He wants to have a relationship with me. And I called him up. And as I was calling him to thank him, full of joy and hope, I look in the pocket to see, you know, is an Armani code? It's to say, especially made for David Meltzer, because it was so beautiful and it fits so perfectly. He had torn all the pockets out of the jacket. He ruined the jacket. So as he's answering, I go from joy back to hurt. And of course, at 30 years old, I don't understand hurt still. So I projected and I said, Dad, I got your jacket. He said, oh, good. Happy birthday, son. I said, happy birthday. Why are you punishing me? He said, what do you mean punishing you? I gave you that jacket. He goes, I want you to hang it in the closet, but dad, I can't wear it. He goes, I know. It's to remind you you're just like me. Money doesn't buy you love or happiness, Dave. I want you to learn this lesson. I didn't learn this lesson too, too late in my life. Please hang the jacket to remind you, you don't have to be the richest man in the cemetery. You cannot take anything with you when you're gone, please. Now, like I said, I wasn't ready for that. I, I was hurt. I told him I hated him once again. I told him he was a liar, a cheater, a manipulator, an overseller, a back-end seller. I wanted nothing to do with him and I was nothing like him. Six years later, my life would change. 
I went golfing with my best friend, Rob. Rob's the guy that asked my wife to go steady with me at sixth grade camp. Uh, mm-hmm. Still to this day, I'm so blessed that I'm the first person ever to ask her to go steady, Julie, and the last. Um, anyway, she, uh, Rob, I wanted to thank him for being such a good friend through my life. Now, I'm a multimillionaire, but I'm also running Lee Steinberg Sports Entertainment. So I went from running Samsung's phone division at 30 to now at 36, running the most notable sports agency, which meant two things. I had more money than I knew what to do with. And two, I had more access. So I could go to the Super Bowl, the Pro Bowl, the Masters, Kentucky Derby, Breeders' Cup, ESPYs, Emmys, Oscars, Grammys. It didn't matter. I had things that people couldn't buy and I had the money to buy what they could. Well, I told Rob, hey, come to the Masters with me. I, I want to share what I have access to. We can go back to the cabins with Curtis Strange. We go to the party with Joe Montana. We'll fly on a net jet private plane. You know, and he looks at me and I'm thinking I'm doing the greatest deed and, and, and gift I could ever give him. And he looks at me and goes, I'm not going. I said, Rob, what do you mean? He said, I don't like who you hang out with and I don't like what you're doing. I don't want any part of it, Dave. I said, oh, come on, Rob. I'm not doing what those people are doing. He, he said, Dave, you can lie to me all you want, but stop lying to yourself. Man, it, it, it still chokes me up because it hit me so hard. I read a book later on in life that says, don't take yes for an answer. From the time I was a millionaire to a multimillionaire, nobody told me anything but yes. And I bought into it. And Rob finally told me the truth, not yes. Two weeks later, my life would change forever. I told Julie, my wife, that I wanted to go to the Grammy Awards with a rapper named Little John. And she said, you shouldn't go. You're not paying attention to me, the family. You're not paying attention to your work. And you're drinking and using drugs. You're partying way too much. I'm really scared for you. Please just stop. Don't go. At that time, 36, I wasn't ready to hear that. So I lied to her. And I went to the Grammy Awards. I came home at 530 in the morning. And I was a wreck, a mess. Can I just st- say one yeah, second? Yeah. What a what a woman! What a woman she is to still be here by your side. That is love. I mean, what a lover. I mean, I mean, oh. I can see the love. Like, man, she's just looking at you, like Dave, Dave, Dave. When are you oh, going to yeah. see what you got? When are you going to see it? Yeah, and wow. I did. And so I came home that night, and that's what she said to me, Dave. You're not a rock star. And I, I, I was drunk and high. And I'm like, I may not be, but I sure feel like one. And she said, well, you're going to feel like one by yourself because I'm leaving you. I love you so much, but I'm leaving you. I'm not happy. I said, what do you mean you're not happy? Look around you. Who do you think? There's a Porsche and a Ferrari in our garage. I can do your, and I was so insulted. I was so offended. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Are you kidding me? I hate you. You don't appreciate anything I've done for you. I have three daughters, by the way, that are under eight at the time. I'm so lost and so unhappy. And I have I have taken for granted for everything, not only that other people wish for, but I wished for. I've taken it all for granted. Who lives their life healthy with the dream girl, dream family, dream houses, cars, golf courses, ski mountain, access, money? everything. And I am sitting here hating this person. And I go to bed and I wake up in the morning and I said, I'm going to take her happiness. I'm going to take her money. And all I could think about was how I could take from her what wasn't hers and wasn't mine. And then I realized I'm sitting there thinking about what lawyer to call. And I swear, I look over in my closet. I hadn't seen this jacket for years, but it was the only jacket that I saw. And I just started crying. I'm looking at that jacket thinking, man, I don't hate my wife. I don't hate my father. I hate myself. I'm a liar. I'm a cheater. I'm a manipulator, overseller, backend seller. I have taken my inheritance, my genetic and and energetic inheritance, and I got to stop it. I got to stop the chain that I have seen happen. And I'm going to stop it right now. My wife told me, you better take stock in who you are and what you want to become or you're going to end up dead. I'm leaving. So I sat there on the end of my bed hour after hour thinking about what I wanted to take stock in. Not what other people wanted for me. Not what was missing. Not what I didn't want. Not things that I didn't need or more things I didn't need or different things I didn't need. Not to impress anyone, let alone impress people I didn't even like. I was going to take stock 
in what I wanted and what I did to become who I was. And that is the day I wrote down four words. I wrote down gratitude, which I was going to live my life with a different perspective. I was going to seek the light, the love, and the lessons in everything. I wrote down a word at the time, empathy. Now, it wasn't sympathy. I, I didn't want sympathy in my life. I, didn't, I knew I couldn't be poor enough to make other people rich. I knew I couldn't be sad enough to make other people happy. I, I knew I couldn't be sick enough to make people well. But empathy was going to be forgiveness. I needed to forgive myself. I had made so many mistakes, created so much pain and struggle that I needed to forgive myself in order to move on. The third word was accountability. Accountability gave me control. See, forgiveness, peace, gratitude, perspective, but accountability, ironically, is counterintuitive. By telling yourself, what did I do to create this mess? And what am I supposed to learn from it? To cease pain, not as a punishment, but as a propellant, something that would propel me to a better place, a better situation, or make my situation better by learning. And I was going to live my life above the line in accountability and then effective communication. Now, I have to admit, when I wrote down effective communication, I meant how do I effectively communicate with everyone in my life, the people most importantly, the people that fed me, my wife, my mom, my siblings, my friends like Rob. How was I going to effectively communicate without projecting my ego? But it became, as I told you, a different effective communication. Because when I realized that there's an all-powerful, all-knowing, omniscient being that cares as much about me that I care about my family, then it became, how do I effectively communicate with source? Allow it to come through me with appreciation, meaning adding the gratitude, forgiveness, and accountability, and then effectively give it away, which is the way you acknowledge what you have by acquiring the knowledge of what you have to give it away to other people. So I had gone from a world of not enough where I was a victim, everything was happening to me, to a world of just for me, a totally unhappy world, buying things I didn't need to impress people I didn't even like, to a new world of abundance where I had faith, faith that there was more than enough of everything for everyone. And I had a great capability of attracting it through me with appreciation, forgiveness, accountability, and inspiration to give it all away, to expand and grow and receive even more. And even though I went bankrupt two years after this day of reconciliation, the day that I took stock in who I was and what I want to become, that was not the basement. The basement was facing my wife and facing my mom to realize how unhappy I was and how shameful I was to take it granted for what not just other people wish for, but imagine losing sight to take for granted what you have wished for your whole life and you've reached a point to take that for granted. So when I lost everything, over $100 million, that did, didn't even phase me. In fact, it scared my wife more that I wasn't phased because I lived with faith that I was being pushed to something better. And here I am 16 years later with everything that I've ever dreamed of and I appreciate it. I forgive myself, I'm accountable for it, and I live inspired every day to empower others, to empower others, to be happy, to make a lot of money, help a lot of people themselves, and have a lot of fun. Those are the three worlds that transcend my journey. It's why I share the story, it's why I share the time with everyone, five minutes for anyone, 20 minutes in person. I give exceptions, of course, I give more than 20 minutes to my friend Christy, uh, but anyone else, please reach out. That's why I put my email up there. Reach out. I give my books for free, my guys for free. I'll sign books. I'll pay for them. I'll send them to you. David at dmeltzer.com. You know, David, um, I, I, I've i always said I feel like you're a brother to me. And because our, our paths and our journeys have been so similar, you know, I'm just the female version in a way of what you experienced with your mama and when you were talking about what she went through and you know, I, I was thinking about when, you know, we lived behind a pizza hut with my mom and she, she wound up, you know, working at the pizza hut and flipping pizzas. 
Um, and she would, pur- she would purposely mess the pizzas up and put them in the car. And we would go to the, the lake at night and we would lay on top of the roof of her car and we would eat pizza and look at the stars. And she would say, baby, do you see those stars? One day you're going to change the world just like that star, you know, changes the world by lighting it up and we get a look at it every night. And, um, you know, it didn't matter if we were digging through trash cans. It didn't matter if my fathers were punching, you know, punching my mother in front of us and we were running for safety or whatever, whatever it was, it was like having her belief in, in me and like your mother believed in you. And it created that hunger. Cause it like, I was like, Oh my gosh. Yeah. I I remember like, I've got to save my mom. I've got to become famous. I've got to become as successful as I possibly can to save her. And what a responsibility that we put on ourselves, you know, at, at the time that happened to you, that, that time that it happened to me, we stopped being a child, right? We started being an adult and taking responsibility for our parent. And, you know, about that same time, I remember my now 25 year old, I'm a grandma, by the way, David, I don't know if you know that I'm a grandma to two grandbabies. It's so beautiful. <laughs> I can't tell by looking at you, but if you tell me that's true, <laughs> I'll believe you. Yeah, two beautiful grandbabies. But my older son, I remember when he was at about 11 years old. I come home one day from from working and uh, he had this this flyer on the counter. And it said, it had a circle with a cross in the middle and it said, animal saver, saving animals. And he went and collected names of his friends to save these endangered eagles. And I looked at him and I was like, son, I'm so proud of you. Like, I really want, I really want to honor you. Why don't you go to my meeting tonight? And there's going to be about 250 people there. And I want you to share with them what inspired you to do this. So we get to the meeting and Dylan comes up to the front of the room and shares what he has done. And um, the audience, you know, of course, it's a lot of women. So our hearts are touched that, you know, a child is, has, has thought of this on his own. And this woman comes up afterwards and she's bawling and she's like, Dylan, I want to give you 10 tickets to the Kansas City Zoo. So when you raise all the money that you are inspired to raise, you can take your friends to the zoo. And so he's just having this moment. And as a mother, as you know, I watch your son all the time on these videos with you. You know, it's so cool that they're getting to listen in. And so we get into the car and at this time, the G wagon that I earned, right. you know, cause I thought that at this point, you know, I would, you know, I would be worth something or lovable if I were able to drive around in these fancy things and live in the fancy houses. And I was like, okay, this is great. So I'm going to incentivize this. So I'm thinking, okay, Dylan, I got a great idea. So as soon as all of your friends raise $50 each, uh, then I'm going to rent a limo and we're going to pick up all your friends and we're going to go to the zoo. We're going to get pizza. It's going to be a great time. And there's dead silence. And he then says, you know, mom, I'm afraid if we tell him that they're going to do it for all the wrong reasons at 11 years old. And I sat there and I thought, wow. And I think... All the time, our children are teaching us. They're smarter than us. We think we're teaching them, but they're actually teaching us. And that's when a big shift happened for me. It was like, I would ask myself, what is the reason I'm really doing this? Why? What is the reason I'm really on this call with David? What is the reason I wake up every morning? What is the reason why I you know, do what I do? And, and we have to always ask ourselves, are our intentions truly pure? Are we conditionally giving or unconditionally giving? And you do that, David. You unconditionally give. Yeah, it, it's so interesting because talking about for the reasons and unconditionality, right? We're all on a journey of progress, not perfection. And I, I, it just, you're talking about that story. And I, I think about, I, I had a Ferrari. And I, I bought it for all the wrong reasons. I, I joke around and say I wanted, you know, everyone to be impressed. I wanted my mom to be proud of me. I wanted people to think I was rich and successful. I wanted women to love me, which is the wrong reason to buy a Ferrari, by the way. All you're doing is truly, uh, you know, confirming your true anatomy to a woman if you, if you have a car like that. <laughs> it's so true. It's so true. <laughs> anyway, uh, so we, this, is, this is one of the, the killer stories of reasons. I bought that car to impress people. I spoke at Beverly Hills High School when I was CEO of Samsung with that Ferrari. And I parked it illegally right out front of, of the school. And I spoke and I thought all the kids were going to be so impressed. And I remember walking to my car and hearing some senior go, 
hey, that's that a-hole with the Ferrari. And it killed me. So here I was years later, I think it was almost 15, 20 years later, and my niece, my youngest niece, uh, my sister's now the head of the PTA at Beverly Hills High. My niece goes there. They asked me to keynote again because, you know, I'm now running a big sports agency and I've learned my lessons. I now drive a Chevy Volt for different reasons. And, you know, because it's probably one of the most practical cars. It was one of the first cars that you could plug in and save our environment, all the things I believe in. And I don't park it in front of the school illegally. I park it into a normal spot and walk like a normal human being to the, the, I'm about to cry, to the thing. I'm leaving. Same way, 15, 20 years later, and some senior says, hey, isn't that the gratitude guy? (laughs) Right? And I think to myself, wow. This this is the story of your son teaching me the same way that this young high school. And then I meet this kid, Tay Sweat, who has the Lamborghini and I and he he does trading and he's very wealthy. And I said, Tay, why why do you have a Lamborghini? Because I'm thinking I'm gonna teach this kid a lesson. You don't need to to have this to impress people, right? And he tells me the reason I have a Lamborghini is because, you know, he he's a, an African American, a black guy, and he said, because I want at-risk kids, they all ask me when I have this car, what do you do? And I tell them, I read books and I teach. I love it. He said, the reason I own this car is because I know it will have the right impact on them, that I want them to strive and see that the way to, because they say, oh, do you play basketball? Are you a rapper? You know, what do you do to get the car? I says, no, I read books and I teach. And to that matter, it's not the object it's the reasons we drive the G-Wagon. It's the reasons we have the Lamborghini. It's the reasons we have a nice house or other things that dictate whether or not we are shopping for the right things because money will buy you happiness. It will buy you love if you shop for the right things for the right reasons. And so what I try to teach people is this abundance that because I went through a period of time where you know money was bad. Right. All of a sudden I learned all these lessons like, wait a second, I'm just going to give all my money away and keep making as much. <laughs> I and did the I'm, same thing. That's crazy. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta have the right reasons. <laughs> now I, was, I have more money than I ever dreamed of. And I do as best as I can all the right things for the right reasons with my money. Oh, wow, David. I, it's just it's so interesting if we were to parallel our stories and just, I, I just think there's so many similarities of, 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 and I think many people that have gotten to that, the, the top of the top in their industry, right? I always say that, you know, Meryl Streep became, Meryl Streep could have stopped at the first Oscar, but why did Meryl Streep keep going? She didn't want to be a one hit wonder, you know, and I think to myself, I don't want to be a one hit wonder. I'm not a one hit wonder, but there's this point, like I also superficially climbed the ladder of achievement because I wanted love and connection more than anything. I just wanted to be seen because I wasn't seen and I, I wasn't loved. I didn't know what love looked like. I didn't know what it felt like and I craved it. And so the more the stadium I filled the audiences that loved my material, the ones that said, you're such a beautiful person. It just made me feel like, wow, like I finally am worthy of love. And then it's that, that shakeup, which was the most profound shakeup, um, that I'll never, I'll never, ever, ever take for granted. It's the most beautiful thing when I'm crying on my floor every day for months and, 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 and literally the ego is being just crushed. And it's like, you're more than this. And it wasn't in a shaming, at times it was shaming because I'm like, you're a global leader. What are you doing? You're on the floor. How proud would your leaders, how proud would the followers be of you now? Look at you, look at you. And so there was shaming and then I felt worse and worse. And then it was like, you know what? This isn't doing me any good. I have to learn to love myself and and I have to become my own best friend. And I have to learn that nothing outside of myself is ever going to fix what's going on on the inside. And and that was the, the beautiful journey um, of coming to this place of recognizing, you know, my partner and I, we just built out a camper van, which I'm, I, David, you and Julie can come actually, if you want to come and take it out, um, we'd love to have <laughs> you take it. We built an, built it in 18 days and we get on the road and we drive and, we pull over and make dinner wherever we want. We lay under the stars and go on top of the roof and we watch the stars. And, you know, I've never been happier in my life in a Dodge Ram van. You know, it's epic. 
And, and it's like, like you said, it doesn't matter what we have. Like I, yeah, I have a Tesla cause the, I believe in, I believe in our, our world and I want to, I want to clean up the world. Right. But I don't need it. I don't need it now. Right. You know, and that's the difference. I love that we can come to that point of, I could have it, but I don't need it. What I, what I think we both have come to, and I don't want to speak for you, but, you know, please tell me if I'm wrong. You know, we both have experienced the three biggest laws uh, and we have finally put them in the right order. And the, and the first law that we've experienced and learned together is the law of gravity. It took us a long time to believe that we're at the right place at the perfect time, that we need nothing. Uh, that the law of gravity has put us here, even though the world's spinning and hurling and rotating at a force and a speed that's unfathomable, to think that we're standing here at the right place at the perfect time with everything we need. And we both, as even as we've been friends, have come to that realization and are firmly standing here. And then one that uh, started when we were young that we shared is the law of Goya, you know, get off your ass. We, we are people that have worked through whatever it is, and we are not quit people. Uh, we are, you know, little burrows that will keep walking up the hill, the little train that could, whatever it is that we're instilled at a young age from the pain and responsibility that was thrust upon ourselves by ourselves. We've always utilized the law of Goya. Uh, we weren't going to sit at home high on our mom's couch, sick and broke, dreaming about what we wanted, just looking at the stars. That wasn't good enough for either of us. And then, how the law of gravity and the law of Goya really put into action the, the law of attraction and the law of allowance uh, and being able to, which is very counterintuitive, hard to reconcile for most people. How can you be consistent and persistent in the pursuit of your potential, but have the law of allowance or the law of attraction in place? And once again, it goes back to the faith, the faith of knowing uh, that I'm going to do everything I can to get to where or angle to what I want. But when the pain, the struggles, the setbacks, and the failures occur, when I'm open-minded, open-hearted, and open-handed to learn those lessons, I will propel myself and others to a better place, a better position, a better situation, or make my situation better. And those three laws, when you speak and tell your stories, and you know, and I do, I watch you, and I have such an emotional attraction to you from the day I met you, just like Julie, you know, which I always say it, it's less obvious with you and Julie because you're so beautiful on the outside that people are like, oh, no, you, you're just attracted. To, I'm like, no, no, no. It's much deeper. Uh, you know, I'm lucky the way I look. Everybody, if you're attracted to me, you know it's emotional. <laughs> so, no, uh, But it's so true to share uh, with you all, you know, that connection. There's no interference. There's a truth, a humility, and a vulnerability that allows us to make a connection. And, you know, we help others do the same. We're celebrants. We both wanted to be ce celebrities, mm -hmm. uh, but you and I have become ce celebrants. Uh, we mm -hmm. elevate others and celebrate others, and there's much more joy that comes from it. So I just love mm -hmm. listening to you, sharing with you, and, and learning mm -hmm. from you. I, I do too. And I have to tell you, David, um, you don't know this, but when you started spending time mentoring me years ago. Little did I know that was the beginning of the darkest night of my soul. And, uh, you know, some of the business things I went through and you coached me through. And there was one thing that you would always say is forgive, forgive yourself. And during that time, I remember because of your beautiful consciousness and your presence and your attention to my soul and my heart, not how much I was earning and what I was achieving because I wasn't you're a friend of yours that was the most successful monetarily, but you, I believe, knew my heart and you knew a part of the process of my transformation meant that I had to forgive. So I went on a forgiveness journey to forgive the three fathers. Well, I've had more than that, but three in my life that had, you know, affected me in a negative way or what I perceived to be negative, right? And um, one of them, I I called and he wasn't ready for that conversation, but in my heart, I felt peace. Another one, I knocked on his door and sat next to him and looked in his eyes and told him, thank you. And he cried. He basically cried in my arms. And my biological father, I asked him to go on a trip with me, a road trip. And on that road trip, 
we shared more laughter and tears than could ever I could have ever dreamed of sharing. And he shared things with me I never thought a father would share with his daughter. But what was crazy was that because of that inspiration to take that forgiveness journey, a few months later, after that, my father died. Um, I had never let him into my heart before because I was afraid to be hurt again by men. And because of the inspiration that you shared of forgiveness and through other little messages of the universe that came to me, I was brave enough to take the forgiveness journey. And because of that, I was able to heal wounds before my father left this planet. So I think um, I want to say to you many things always, but thank you for doing the work. Thank you for falling from the penthouse to the outhouse. As hard as it was, you got up and your, your love and your light spreads like a wildfire, the wildfire we want, the wildfire of the heart. And you will never truly know the ripple effect that you have on people like you have had with my life. And because of that, I am also continuing to create ripples of the heart, ripples of love. So thank you so much. I love you so much. I love you and your family. You're beautiful. I just, I pray for the most incredible happiness and love to always be in your hearts every single day. And I appreciate you taking your time to be with me today and all of our listeners. Well, thank you for this journey. Thank you for being such a wonderful friend. And thank you most of all for helping me with my mission, which is to empower others, to empower others, to be happy. I'm always looking for that thousand people that I know can inspire, elevate, and celebrate another thousand people to inspire, elevate, and celebrate another thousand. That's how we're going to get to this collective consciousness. We can change the world. So when we both lied there as little kids thinking about we can actually change the world. And, you know, at 50 years old, when I got the chills because my 12 year old friend committed suicide and we had a happiness problem. And I thought to myself, people, they're going to laugh at you. What are you thinking? You're going to, you're going to go home and tell your wife, your mission in life is to make people happy. They're going to make fun of you, mock you again. And, uh, I'm okay with it because I know there's at least a thousand people like you in my lifetime that will get us to a collective consciousness. And someday, instead of laughing, mocking me, making fun of me, they'll applaud and they'll be happy. And I just, uh, I'd love to end on that. I'd love you. There's nothing more I can say. My eyes and my tears and my heart and my mind say it all. So please, let's do this again. Anything I can do to be of service, please everyone reach out, david at dmelter.com. Be kind to your future self. Do good deeds. Thank you, Christy. Thank you, David. We love you. God bless. We love you too. God bless you. Imagine the feeling of seeing your dreams manifest in front of your very eyes. Through the power of the law of attraction and intentional daily visualization, your dream life can be made into reality. Visualize video is a powerful tool to take your vision board to the next level. See your life play out in front of you like a movie trailer. Increase the intensity of your meditation or amplify the vibration of your visualization with Visualize Video, a tool to use in your daily routine to help you create the life of your dreams. Let us help you manifest more. With our incredibly insightful questionnaire, we will give you a unique video with affirmations to make your dreams a reality. Get your own Visualize Video today and start manifesting all your desires now. Go to visualizevideo.com. That's visual, V-I-S-U-A-L. E-Y-E-S video.com and use the code love20. That's L-O-V-E two zero for 20% off. Thank you so much for listening to love and serve podcasts. It is my sincere hope that the rest of your day is filled with abundance, love, and light. Know that I believe in you and know that when you shine your light, you unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. You are making an impact. I can't wait to see you on the next episode of Love and Serve. For more information, you can go to thelovegypsy.com and follow us at Christy Dryling Beauty on Instagram.